All right, let's go ahead and open in a prayer. Father, we thank you so much for uh, today. We thank you for this opportunity uh, to be in your house. And as uh, some of us have said earlier, we're just glad to be on the side of the dirt. And so, Father, may we uh, use this time wisely. God, may we see the great opportunity that still exists in front of us to, to know you, uh, to understand your word better, and to faithfully live this life for you. And so, God, I pray that you would uh, meet us here tonight. Would you encourage us? God, would you comfort us? Uh, Father, would you hear the cries of our hearts? God, would you hear the longing and the groanings uh, deep within our souls? And God, I pray that your spirit would truly intercede on our behalf. God, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Father, we thank you once again for this time. And God, I pray that you just uh, remind us of the necessity uh, to pray. God, and tonight in our scripture, you encourage us to, to pray even when we don't have the words or, or know what to say. But God, I pray that nonetheless that we would be encouraged, that we would see that prayer is one of the very things that continually anchors us to you. And so when we don't have the words to speak, God, we know and we can trust that your spirit speaks on our behalf. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
right. All right. Good evening, everyone. I hope you are well this beautiful Wednesday evening. Hopefully the weather has been treating you guys well. It's not too hot and not too cold. I know in the mornings it can be a little on the chillier side. Uh, but with that said, last week we started to dig deeper into Romans chapter 8. And because of time constraints, we couldn't cover everything that was fully said in, in that one section of Scripture in one shot. And so we broke it up into two parts, two parts uh, but kind of being able to recall last week will, will serve uh, us well as we go through today's portion, right? And so just to go over it uh, really briefly with you guys, uh, last week our, our focus was having this mindset or being set on obtaining what is hoped for, right? Meaning the, the thing that we are anxiously awaiting for our lives, and that is as we finish the race that we will be able to enter into the kingdom of God, that we have a hope in Jesus' the second coming, right? These are all things that are very basic to our faith. And what we see is Paul um, kind of bring this to the forefront, right? But the reason why he is writing this and the perspective in which he is addressing these things is in relation to what we, what we would imagine to be the difficulties that the church was facing, right, in that time, right, in, this, in the context of uh, the book of Romans being written, right, trying to understand uh, the difficulties and, and the complications that they faced trying to live for the gospel, right, in a place where, uh, in, 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 a, in a social climate, in a social environment where Jesus and the gospel weren't normalities, right? It's still something that's still new. It's still something that's fresh. It's still something that is, I, I think we can go as far as saying as maybe feared or even misunderstood. Right? It's not like how it is today. I think in today's day and age, obviously, the church is more of a, a normalcy, right? Going to church and knowing who Jesus is and all, all these things are, I would say, more accepted in, our, in today's day and age than they were when they were first on the scene, all right? But understanding the context, right, we, we uh, have to, we, we also have to acknowledge that it came with this fair share of struggles, right, trying to live for the gospel, right? And with that was this difficulty for you as a Christian to establish uh, and solidify your identity as a follower of Christ, Right? Because with any, with any difficulty or with any season of, of trouble, one of the things that gets shaken is what, how, how we view ourselves in, in, in the gospel as people who are saved and redeemed by Jesus Christ. And when it gets tougher, when it's a difficult season, we probably find ourselves asking the question, man, is this, is this worth it? Right? And so what we see Paul is, Paul is coming from this place trying to identify with the difficulties. While in the same breath, urging them, imploring with them to press forward. And that's the whole idea of obtaining the very thing that we hope for, eternal life, right? Just being able to finish this race and, 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 and live and press on and just remembering what awaits those whose faith will be found in Jesus. And so tonight in our scripture, it's a continuation from Paul's encouragement, his, his, his urge to the church. And one thing I should mention uh, before we get into our scripture is that uh, Paul's perspective and source of motivation for all of this is, isn't coming from a place like, hey, like, can you, can you muster up a self-will? Can you just figure it out within your, your own self to, to, to keep going? Or can you just try to find deep, search deep within your, your own self and you'll figure it out, right? That's not Paul's plan, that's not Paul's perspective, and that's definitely not his angle, right? He isn't calling for them to dig down deep. Instead, he is continually making the case, right? It's important for us to remember this, is that he's continually making the case for them to rely more on God, more on Christ, and more on the Holy Spirit. And the reason why that's important for us to understand it and to remember as we look at our scripture tonight it's because, once again, we've been saying it all over, as we've been studying the book of Romans, our goal is to what? Better understand the gospel so that we can better appreciate the gospel and, as a result, have a more reliance when it comes to our lives as we try to live for the glory of God and live this life faithfully, right? And so Paul is taking away any 
self will out any self determination because that's not everybody, right? But what he's saying, everyone who calls upon the name of Jesus Christ can do the things that he is suggesting or urging them to attach themselves to, right, for lack of a better description. So with that said, today we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 8, verses 26 to 30. So if we could stand for the public reading of God's word tonight, and uh, I pray that you would give ear to God's holy and living word. So continuing on, starting with verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we, uh, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us be seated. You know, when it comes to the, the struggles and hardships that we face in life, I think one of the most disheartening things to go through is to face those things, but to feel like you're alone. Right? One of the most discouraging, one of the most disheartening things is to go through life Bearing your struggles, bearing your burdens, and feeling like you are doing it all alone. Like there's nobody around you who can help you or even acknowledge what you're going through, right? There's no one that you can depend on, and there's no one who can step in and at the very, at the very least embrace you. Or that the feeling of, of loneliness in the midst of our struggles is one that can weigh down very, very heavily. It's discouraging. And in a situation like that or to be in a season like that, it can be very, very difficult to be hopeful in, in, in any moment of that, of that trial. And so when you think about that, you can understand where Paul is coming from as he uh, identifies with the, the church in Rome's struggles. But you can also see some why it's important for us to acknowledge why Paul is bringing up the Holy Spirit, right? Because the reality of the situation is because even though we might feel like we are alone, even though it might feel like we're on an island all by ourselves as we are going through these seasons, these struggles, these persecutions, these, these moments and seasons of confusion, the thing that Paul is pushing very, right in front of us is that what? You're, you're not alone. And I think we can go as far as saying that you are never alone, right? Especially if you have the Holy Spirit. And that's why the Holy Spirit is the solution to the very problems that they are experiencing. You see, in verse 26, we start to see what makes the presence of the Holy Spirit so necessary for our lives as we are trying to be faithful to the gospel and the calling that is placed on our lives to essentially obtain, right, the very thing that we hope for. In verse 26, Paul says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So when Paul says likewise, or as some translations say in the same way, Paul is referring back to the groanings of, of creation, the very thing that we kind of talked about briefly. You see, and so Paul brings this up because he is setting up the solution to the very problem that they're facing. And that is the spirit or understanding and realizing or acknowledging that the spirit is present and available in light of our suffering. You see, Paul is trying to get the church to see just how helpful the spirit is. He says the spirit helps us in our what? And our weakness, and the very thing that you're, you're feeling discouraged, and the very, and the very, in the, the very weight of, of feeling disheartened, 
or even hopeless. He's saying when we are feeling at the lowest, God's not done with us. God's not abandoning us. But he is saying that he is still present. And he is there to do what? Not to just look at us and shake, it, shake his head like, man, you got yourself into this again. Even though that might be a conviction, right? You might have. But it says that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. The Greek word for help is kind of a very lengthy word, right? It's kind of a long word uh, in Greek for English four-letter word. But the Greek word for help is sunanti lam ban omai, right? And, 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 right? And, and it's a word that means to take hold of anything with another, to take part in his burden or work, and thus to give help. Right? It speaks of the action of a person coming to another's aid by taking hold over against that person of the load that he is carrying. Right? It's not just like, hey, I'll help you, but this is an actual physical interaction. But the person helping does not take the entire load, but helps the other person in its endeavor. Right? It's there to, to kind of spot you. Right? It's there to help you get up. It's there to help you press on. And it's the same word that we see in Luke chapter 10, verse 40, with a story that is very familiar where uh, Martha and, and Mary invite Jesus to come over. And, and Mary is found sitting at the foot of Jesus, right, as he's teaching and, and so forth. And, and Martha complains to Jesus, why is she helping me? It's the same word. Meaning that she wanted Martha, or she, Martha wanted Mary's physical help in the kitchen preparing the things. You see, help here means to take hold oneself at his end of the task together with another. It can also be translated as bid her lend me a helping hand, right? The idea that being the idea that the idea being that Martha would continue preparing the meal but needed Mary to help her finish a job at a faster pace, at a faster rate, to lessen the, the burden. And so when we think about that, that Greek word, right? The Greek word for help, right? The Holy Spirit. Right, comes to the aid of the saints in his or her spiritual distress and difficulties. But this is how the Holy Spirit helps us. Not by taking over the responsibility. Right, not fully relieving us of the thing that we need to do. But the Holy Spirit helps us complete the thing that we are responsible for. Right, the, the Holy Spirit is, doesn't finish the job. But the Holy Spirit equips us, lends us his strength, lends us his wisdom to finish the job, right? It, it, it helps us to work out our problems. And in, in other words, the Holy Spirit helps us and puts us in a position to where not weak, to not only where we can complete the task, but we can learn from it, right? The, 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 we have to understand just how helpful the Holy Spirit is. You see, that is how the Holy Spirit helps us and aids us in the midst of our weakness. And weakness, right, if, we, if you don't know, literally means without strength and speaks of the state of incapacity to do the thing that you're trying to do. But if we're trying to put this into a better perspective, then what is the weakness that Paul is referring to? Right? What is the weakness that Paul is referring to? I think the more that we read, the more that we realize that Paul isn't referring to our physical weaknesses. But more importantly, Paul is speaking into our weaknesses that we experience spiritually. More, more, more specifically, the things that are unseen to the eye, but that are deeply felt emotionally, psychologically, mentally. And they actually, our spiritual weakness actually affects the way that we function on the outside, right? So more than this being a physical issue, it's more of a spiritual issue that the Holy Spirit serves as a solution to. You see, the example that Paul leads with in terms of how the Spirit helps us spiritually is that the Spirit is what? Interceding on our behalf when we don't know or have the words to pray, I know, that, I know that this is a scripture that we're all very familiar with. And so this just serves as a great reminder for us, a great source of encouragement. But the Holy Spirit helps uh, our, our weakness, right, our inability to pray, I, I would say, intelligently about situations. 
And how does it do it? The scripture tells us that it, it prays with these unutterable groanings too deep for our comprehension. But they signify the deep pains that we experience. But the reason why the Holy Spirit interceding for us is something that is important, an important tool for us to access and to remember is because in my experience, not just personally, but witnessing others, when, when we don't know what to pray for or how to pray for certain things, do you know what happens? We usually don't. Right? When, when, when we in our own minds think that I, I don't even know how to pray for that. Or I don't even know how I should pray. Or I don't even know what to do in that moment. That's kind of just how we limit ourselves. And very rarely do we take it a step further and try to pray for those things. Instead, we, 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 we don't. Right? We just go, oh, I'll figure it out later. And then we put it off. But can I tell you that a prayer that isn't said is a prayer that isn't prayed, right? Not, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that just because you don't utter those words or things on prayer. Like obviously, a lot of us, we pray in our hearts. But when we stop ourselves and say, you know what, I don't know what to pray, so I'm not going to pray, guess what happens? You didn't pray. You, you thought about it, and you kind of left it at that. And that feeling of not knowing what to do or how to do certain things usually prevents us from even trying at all. Charles Spurgeon tells us to never give up praying even when Satan suggests that prayer is in vain. I, I didn't put it up there for you guys. I'll read it again, though. He says, never give up praying. Never give up praying even when Satan suggests that that prayer is in vain. In other words, he's saying you, we have to keep praying even though it feels like your prayer is not good enough. We have to keep praying even though it feels like you're not praying for the right things or in the right way. But he, he says that Satan will suggest to us or deceive us into saying, you know what? Yeah, you shouldn't pray because you don't have no idea what you're saying. He says this, right? Then he adds, right? We can, you can read it along as, our, as I read it. But he says, if your heart is cold, do not wait until your heart, is war your heart warms. Pray your soul into heat with the help of the ever-blessed Holy Spirit who helps us in our weakness, who makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered, never sees prayer for any reason. And I think, that, I, think, I think that's a lot of us, right? We, we, he says, if your heart is cold, don't wait, for your, wait until your heart is warm. And I think that's kind of, kind of when we, we don't know what to pray. We say, you know, let me figure it out first. Or let me figure out how, how to pray. Or let me, I'll just wait, maybe because maybe right now is not the time to pray. But he's saying, he said, just have a go at it. He's saying, just, just pray. Right? And I, I think that we, we have the acronym PUSH, right? And that is what? Pray until something happens. Right? We, we see, even though we don't know what to pray or how to pray or what we ought to pray for, when you have that conviction or when you recognize a struggle or when you re realize that you, you are in a moment of weakness or you're, you're, susceptible to the sin or whatever the case might be, that shouldn't limit us because I don't know what to pray for. That shouldn't stop us. If anything, right, when we don't know what to pray or how to pray or how to put it into words, and I think for a lot of us, we, we probably think, um, oh, well, I need to come up with a fancy way to say it. Right? And obviously, the, what the, the prayer that Paul is calling for us to do is not like a public prayer, right? So, like, if you've ever had the, have the opportunity to come up and, and pray publicly, Paul's not asking you to come up here and just be silent and go amen, right? That's not what he's asking us for, the, for us to do. But he's, he's calling for us in, 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 our, in our alone time, right, when we were by ourselves, that we would pray, right? But when we don't know how to, that should serve as a reminder to us to come before God in whatever posture we pray with and just say, God, you know what, I don't, I don't know what to say or how to pray for this particular thing, but I'm struggling. God, it's hard, right? And help me. And that's all you got to do. And from there, you just sit in silence, waiting upon the Lord, and you let the Spirit help you. You let the Spirit intercede for you. And, you know, 
Scripture doesn't tell us if the Spirit's groanings are going to be something that is audible for us, right, to hear. Right, so don't sit in silence and just wait for them some kind of grunting or loud groaning because I don't know if I don't know if that's going to show up for you, right? But but the, but there, but there's a, there's a trust and, and a faith in the waiting, right? And I, I think that's what really matters. Not that we need to hear an audible groaning that's too deep for words, but trust that the Spirit is interceding on our behalf. You see, in verse twenty-seven, Paul goes on to say. Right? And, and he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And the Greek word for heart is cardia. And it refers not to our physical organ, but it, always, it is always used figuratively in Scripture to refer to the seat and center of human life. The heart is the center of the personality. And it's the very thing that drives and controls our intellect, our emotions, and even our will. And so no outward obedience is of the slightest values unless the heart, the cardia, has turned to God. You see, William Lewis suggests, or he gives us some insight into the matter. He, sa- he adds, God the Father who searches the hearts of his saints understands the intent or bent of an un, the bent of our unutterable prayers. Right? Unutterable because we do not know the particular thing we should pray for in connection with a certain circumstance. For he, referring to God, knows the mind of the Holy Spirit praying for us. And in our steed, in our prayers, in the case of the above mentioned items for prayer, the Holy Spirit praying according to the plan of God in our lives. Did you catch that? The last line. The Holy Spirit praying according to the plan of God for our lives. And so we may not know what to pray, but the Spirit knows. And the Holy Spirit, when it is interceding on your behalf, when it is praying for you, the thing that we have to realize and trust in and find comfort in and even conviction is that it is praying for us in line with the will of God. That means if I've strayed and I'm struggling, the Spirit is praying that I would find my way what? Back to God. If I've been out of alignment with God, meaning that he hasn't been the center of my life, maybe he's kind of been on, on, the, on the precipice of what's going on in my life, the Spirit is praying for me to be correct or straightened out with God. Is praying that God will come back into the center. And I might, I might not realize that at the time. You may not realize that at the time. But the Spirit knows the very things that have come, probably have gotten us into trouble or have caused a misunderstanding. Maybe we've kind of diluted the gospel by allowing other things in, which would be one of the things that the Romans are struggling with, the church in the Rome is struggling with. Because they're trying to figure out, how do, how do I live for Christ in this world? How do I live for Christ in this society? How do I live for Christ as all of these things are going on around in my life that are causing confusion and even chaos? And the thing that we have to understand is that when we don't know what to pray for or whether it's a cause... We can't come before the Holy Spirit and say, like, I don't know. I don't know. How me figure it out? And the Holy Spirit knows what to pray even when we don't know what to pray. And when we might be praying for the wrong things, the Holy Spirit is able to correct that. I believe the Holy Spirit can give us a conviction. Right? The same God who searches our hearts is in sync with the Spirit because they are one of the same in their trinity of divinity. So then if we look at verse 28 with all of this in mind, which so happens to be on the short list, right? Verse 28, 28 happens to be on the short list of verses that are always misquoted and taken out of context, right? Just you find Jeremiah 29, 11, and then you look over to the right, you'll find Romans 8, 28, right? But that's a story for another day. But this 28 says this, and we know that those who love God all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Right? Those who love God. It's very easy for anybody to say, I love God. 
right? It's, it's very easy to, to, to say that out loud. It's very easy to say that convincingly with a smile, right? It's easy to bring that up in, in conversation without hesitation. But who loves God? Like, what's a biblical marker that distinctly identifies someone who loves God? I think it's important to establish because all things can't work together for good when we aren't loving God correctly, which kind of just happens to be one of the reasons why we might find ourselves in a predicament where we are feeling weak and discouraged and lost. So who loves God? In the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 15, it points us into the right direction because Jesus himself says this. He says, if you love me, right, once again, I love God, I love God, and if that is the case, then what? You will keep my commandments. And so in other words, loving, God's mean, loving God means I am constantly making an honest attempt to keep God's commandments, a.k.a. live out the word of God in my life faithfully. And so loving God isn't just a proclamation with words. It is also a statement that is made with the way that we are living our lives. And so if we're trying to piece all this together, then that is our starting point. And it's important for us to establish and understand that because who doesn't want all things to work together for good? We want things to go well in our lives. We, 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 want, some, we want some solidity. We, we, we want some things to be consistent. And that begins with, with those who are loving God. But the thing that that tells us is that, well, the thing that, that reminds us of or kind of sets us into the direction of is that those who are loving God, that statement is meant to keep us accountable while also encouraging us to continually pursue righteousness. And so the statement of those who love God is like, well, we, that's, we need to check ourselves. Am I loving God? How, how have I been loving God lately? Have I not been loving God? Is that why things are kind of out of whack? Is that why uh, things are out of sync? Is that why things are kind of going, seem like it's going downhill for me? Not that that could that be a cause, but that's a, a thing that we should take a step back and to prayerfully think about. Right? Because loving God is something that is meant to keep us accountable and on the right path that we would do our, 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 that we would honestly and genuinely pursue God in the things that he has set up for us, right? The statement of those who love God is meant to encourage us, but at the same time, reveals us what we're not doing. You see, all things is a very comprehensive expression Right, all things together for good. Right? And Paul isn't saying that God prevents his children from experiencing things that can harm them. Right? This isn't like a, a thing that you just speak out and it just makes you invincible right, to all the things in the world. That's not how it works. Right? You see, John MacArthur, he adds, he kind of gives us some, some insight. He says, God is rather attesting that the Lord takes all that he allows to happen to his beloved children. And once again... We know that God doesn't allow us. God doesn't allow us to experience things that we can't handle, right, or that He can't save us from. Right? He says, but even the worst things, and turns those things, right, ultimately into what blessings. So no matter what our situation, our suffering, our persecution, our sinful failure, our pain, or our lack of faith in those things, as well as in all other things. God, our Heavenly Father, will work to produce our ultimate victory and blessing. The corollary of that truth is that nothing can ultimately work against us. Why? Because we have the Holy Spirit. Right? We have the Holy Spirit that is helping us. The Holy Spirit is taking what is heavy and make, making it less heavy. I mean, for those of you that have ever gone to the gym and, and you ever needed a spotter, right, you, you might be able to do that weight a few, a few times. But the fourth time, 
Whew. It's not like the spotter just automatically lifts up the bar because you, that's not how you get stronger. But what does it do? It might yell at you. Or it might motivate you. It might slightly raise that bar so that you can, go, you can complete the thing that you're doing. And by, that, and by, by, by the Holy Spirit spotting you, it makes you stronger for the next time. It allows you to grow. It allows you to mature. And God is using all of these situations, good and bad, together. And he's working that together for good because ultimately that's going to allow us to grow. It's going to allow us to become stronger. It's going to allow us to be more mature. It's going to allow us to be more reliant and less reluctant to turn to God in our moments of weaknesses. Because that's the biggest struggle, right, is that when we are weak, instead of turning to God, we turn to other things. But here we see Paul saying, like, no, in your weakness, you need to turn to God. In your weakness, you need to rely on the Holy Spirit because those are the things that are going to allow you to grow from whatever it is that you are facing. It is when we turn away and rely less on the Holy Spirit that it becomes very, very difficult for us to learn from the very things that we're struggling with. And the moment that those things come around again, guess what we find ourselves doing? Struggling all over again, still feeling weak when we have the opportunity to grow and to become stronger. You see, it's not that God causes nothing but good things to happen. Instead, God is able to take the bad and somehow turn it into a not so bad. I don't want to say he can turn it into good because sometimes that's, that's a process. But he's able to take the, not, the bad and make it not so bad. And as, and as we mature, that not so bad can eventually turn into good from our perspective and our understanding. And like we talked about last week, a key ingredient for that is holding on to the hope that we have in Christ. In verse 29, Paul continues by saying this, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. You see, when Paul assures the Roman church that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, he then follows in this verse with God's work of predestination as a reason why we can be assured of this truth, right? In short, predestination, far from being given to the to cause the division, is given that it might bring comfort and assurance. And the next verse looks at predestination from a futuristic perspective, which we'll get to a little bit later, right? But if God has always acted for our good and will in the future act for our good, Paul reasons then will he not also in our present circumstances work every circumstance together for good as well? You see, in this way, predestination is seen as a comfort for believers in everyday events of life. But I should add that this, this statement of predestination isn't about a select few, right? And we're not going to stir the pot tonight or dig down deep into, into whether what is predestination and all these things, right? But I am a firm believer that when it comes to predestination, the one thing that is sure is that God predestined that he would send his one and only son to die for us. And that's the very thing that Paul is iterating here, right? He, he's not saying that, hey, man, this is only for a select few. But he's saying that God predestined that his son would come and he would be the one to be our relief, our solution. And so stated another way, the truth of predestination applies only to saved people. Right? In, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, we see or we, we are reminded of the Father's heart. And it says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward whom? You not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. It doesn't say that a select few would reach repentance. It says that all, that all should reach repentance. And that's why when we think of a predestination, it's not about a select few, even though not everyone will confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and accept him. But God put it out there. That he predestined that his son would be the very solution. To humanity's problem, all right? So moving on, all right, right? So with verse 29 in mind, let's look at verse 30, and we'll wrap things up for today. And it says, Though, for those whom he predestined, he also called. 
And he, those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Right? So in this idea of predestination, the goal is to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Right? Once again, God predestined that his son would not only be our solution, but would be the very model, the very blueprint for us to model our lives after Right, the more Christ-like that we become, right, the more we are able to live this life for the glory of God. You see, because of Christ and the hope that we have in him, Paul says that we've been called. Right, there's a calling place in your lives as somebody who knows the gospel and who's responded to the gospel. As a result of this calling, you've also been justified. Right, because of Jesus, we've been declared righteous, because simply Jesus is righteous. When God sees us, he doesn't see us, but he will see his son. And as a result of that, when the time comes, we will also be glorified with him. But all that can be thrown away, right, if we don't continually work for the very thing that we set out to attain. Right? If, if our hope dwindles, and we lose sight of the very things that God has already established and provided for us through his son, Jesus Christ. And that is why the Spirit is helping us. That is why the Spirit is interceding on our behalf. That is why the Spirit is our help. Why? Because the Spirit is there to help us press on. It's not there to do the work for us, but it's there to lessen the load. It's there to, to push us when we need, we need an extra push. It's there to spot us when we need a little bit of extra help. It's there to pick us up when we've fallen down. Right? It's there to encourage us when we stop to take a knee and to take a breath. Right? The Spirit is there because God wants us to finish the race. Right? It is helping us press on. It is helping us see how God is at work in our lives and how the Spirit is moving to help us be aware of all that God is doing and all the things that God can do, right? Because even in the bad, God is able to work all things together for good. But that is only possible when we are continually relying on the Holy Spirit because what? We love God. And how do I love God? I'm doing my very best to live out the very word that he, and the commands that he has placed in my lives. And so church, would you allow the Spirit to help you? Don't be... Don't allow the unknown or the weaknesses to turn you away, but that may that serve as a cue, as a conviction to continually turn to him. Amen. Amen. With that said, let us stand and we'll close in prayer. Father, we thank you once again for tonight. God, we thank you for the help that you continually give us through your Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that you would help us to, in, in our moments of weakness, to to be reminded of where we're not bearing these burdens alone, that we're not going through uh, these seasons of distress by ourselves, but the Holy Spirit is there anxiously waiting for us to, to pray and to rely on you. And God, when we don't even know what to say or what, how, how to get started, we, we can trust and know that the Holy Spirit is and can intercede on our behalf. And so, Father, I pray that our weaknesses will not serve as limitations but would they be even more reasons for us to look to you and to trust in you? And I pray that, at, that you would help, that through the intercession of your Holy Spirit, that you would help us to be reminded of what is your will. And God, if, we've, if we're going astray, if we're caught up in the wrong things, I pray that the Holy Spirit will serve as a conviction uh, to come back and to place you at the very center that you belong in our lives. And now we just ask that the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that the unconditional love of God our Father, and may the anointing, the power, the wisdom of the Holy Spirit truly be with us. And as we leave, may it also intercede on our behalf, especially when we don't have the words uh, to say. May the Holy Spirit cover you and be with you until we meet in God's house once again. Amen and amen. Thank you, church. May you go in peace.